have a little introduction into basic swap and also an introduction into atomic swaps in general. We'll talk about HTLCs and PTLCs, and then we're going to see how we can make all of that work on Monero. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many of you know how atomic swaps work? A bit? OK, good. Uh, I'll give you a, a small introduction to atomic swaps, and we'll kind of build up our way all the way down to making it work on Monero, which arguably is a bit, a bit of magic there. Um, so what's basic swap? Basic swap is a DEX platform that allows you to trade uh, cryptocurrency safely without third parties. So it's atomic swap based. It currently supports uh, seven coins, including Monero and Bitcoin. And um, it's entirely open source and released under the MIT license. So you can do whatever you want with it. It's free, unrestricted, and private. So what's an atomic swap? Well, an atomic swap allows you to swap cryptocurrencies uh, without a trusted third party. Uh, one of the most, like the biggest example of a third party would be a centralized exchange. Um, this centralized exchange would be would receive the currency, the cryptocurrency, from the two parties uh, and basically hold it until um, each each uh, put up the agreed upon amount, and then only then will it transfer uh, the swap. So why use an atomic swap? Well, atomic swaps have a potentially higher degree of privacy. I say potentially. We'll get more into this. Um, and they're also more censorship resistant. Uh, this means as long as the miners uh, take, your, uh, take your transactions and are willing to mine them, you can swap. And last but not least, you can start trusting code instead of people. Now, you probably know these two exchanges, but if you don't, these were, uh, these were exchanges that did not do well. Um, they failed, and a lot of people lost their money. Um, I like to say that they are uh, better at making your money disappear than mother with us. Um, and we'll see how we can replace these trusted intermediaries and uh, basically make them go away. So what's an atomic swap? We'll start off with a little example. Um, so we have Alice, and she has one Bitcoin, and she wants to swap it with Bob for one Litecoin. Um, so what they do is they make two, two contracts, one on each blockchain. Uh, this contract contains the same agreements and the same conditions. Um, and these contracts then get, get transformed into addresses that can receive money. So Alice will deposit her Bitcoin into an address that is under control of this contract. Uh, Bob does the same with Litecoin, but on, the, and, but on the Litecoin side. So both send the agreed upon amount to the address, and then we say that both contracts are funded. Now here's the magic of an atomic swap. And this is key to remember that, that when Alice redeems her Litecoin, when she completes her end of the swap, she reveals a secret. And this secret is a condition inside a contract. So the contract says, hey, you need to reveal a secret before you can take out the money. And when she does reveal that secret, Bob can also take that secret because it's publicly available and then use it on his side to uh, redeem the Bitcoin. Um, so this is a, a general thing that you will see in atomic swaps that is like very common. There's going to be a secret that only one of the two and two people know. And when one person takes, takes it out, it will reveal the secret to the other person. And that's when we get into HTLCs. So HDLCs are hash time locked contracts. It's quite the mouthful, so I'll just say HDLCs. Um, and what you need to know about HDLCs is that there are essentially just two conditions. There is a time condition, and there is something we'll call the password condition. This is the condition, uh, the password condition, is one where you will feel a secret. But let's look at the time condition first. So a time condition is, is relatively straightforward. We'll, by example, we'll see uh, before 2 p.m., only Alice can spend it. Um, and after 2 p.m., both Alice and Bob can spend it. And the password condition is a bit more complicated. Um, I don't know if you know what hashing is, but I'll, I'll go qu quickly through that. And basically, hashing is a technique where we take a piece of text, let's say the secret, and we do a mathematical transformation that turns it into some garbled piece of text. 
and it's a one-way street. Like, if I give this garble text to, to you, you, for example, you wouldn't know uh, what created this garble text. Only if you have, like, the, the secret end, the original value, can you easily generate the, the garble text. And this garble text will call it a hash. And that's how we basically build a hash-based commitment schema. In the contract, we will put a, a, a condition that says, hey, you need to reveal the, the secret for this hash, for this garble text. And that's how we can make someone commit to revealing a secret. Um, and in this case, we'll, we'll make this condition to spend the money from one of the contracts. And on the right, you can see basically one of these contracts as code. It's, uh, this is uh, one for Bitcoin. And um, yeah, it's only 20 lines of code. So it's, it's relatively simple to understand if you ever want to take your time and look into that more deeply. And in our contract, in hash time log contract, you can only have two scenarios. Either you're redeeming the money, the swap goes through correctly, or we're refunding. The, one of the parties decided in the middle, hey, I want to abort, or they just disappeared. Uh, and then we go through refunding. But let's take a look at redeeming first. So redeeming, like I said before, requires revealing a secret, but also a signature by the redeemer. So just having a secret is not enough. You also need to prove that you are Alice or Bob. So it's not like we said, without, it's without trusted third parties. It's only Bob and Alice involved, but they do need to provide a proof to the blockchain to say, hey, I'm Alice or Bob. And the refunding part does not require revealing the secret because one of the two parties, for example, Bob, doesn't have the secret. So if, he, if, if it suddenly Alice disappears, his money would be locked. So that, that, that scenario doesn't require showing the secret, um, but it also requires a signature by Bob. And yeah, the time has to be a certain time to allow Alice enough time to to actually redeem her end. So what are the problems? Well, um, so we have two contracts on two chains, and they have the same same hash, the same secret, secret ha ha hashed secrets. And this kind of links them between, with each other. So we have, we have a problem where anyone can suddenly see, hey, these two transactions, they are linked. This is a swap, and it's this amount being swapped for that amount. And that's problematic because arguably you could say that in a centralized exchange, only the centralized exchange knows. Now, suddenly, everyone can figure it out. Another problem, especially in this context, is that Monero simply does not support this type of programmable contracts. So we cannot make this work. And then comes along point time lock contracts. And PTLCs solve some of these issues. It was first invented by Andrew Polstra in 2017 when he was working on scriptless scripts for Mimblewimble. And it was initially described with Schnorr signatures, which allows aggregating signatures easily, and we'll get into that later. So what I want you to know about point time lock contracts is that the time lock hasn't changed. It's still the same, um, nothing complex there. The, the thing that has changed is what I refer to as the password condition. So instead of it being a hash or a hash lock where you have to give a secret that produces a garbled text. Um, we, we change how we get to that secret and we use elliptic curve cryptography. And basically, how it works is you'll reveal a value publicly on the blockchain, which the, only the other party can, can use to recover a hidden key. So it's the same secret commitment uh, and we, we still gets revealed, but now it doesn't get revealed to everyone the secret, it just gets revealed to the other party. And that's where adapter signatures basically come in. So they, they are basically a special type of signature that commit to a hidden value. You can look at it as like, I give you a key, but it's booby trapped. And if you want to use the key, you'll have to get past the booby trap. But if you get past the booby trap, I get the secret. It's basically, if you're going to use it, you're going to tell me a secret. And using this signature, this signature will basically reveal a hidden value. And we use this kind of scheme just because it is a, a nice way to get around the requiring program abilities like scripts uh, on a blockchain. And for Schnorr, uh, it's actually a really elegant scheme. Um, so I'm going to quickly describe it, not too deep, but you basically have this, booby, this, this signature that is booby-trapped. And I give it to the other person, and they can, they can uh, not use it at that point. They have to do some manipulations. But I've had a booby trap that basically forces them to reveal a secret. Um, and 
basically what, is it, what it can do is he produces his end of the site and he can aggregate them. And what's really clever about the scheme is that you know, only um, each party um, only had its half of the private key. So you're making, essentially making a signature for a key that nobody ever had in its entirety. It was two halves that were just added together and magically it produced a valid signature. So what are the problems with this? Well, back in the day, uh, Schnorr signatures were not, were not possible. So uh, Taproot wasn't yet activated. And um, ECDSA is another way to make signatures uh, that, that, was, that is still very prominently used um, by a lot of chains. So if you want to build a successful DEX and support lots of coins, you're going to need to kind of have adapter signatures, not only for Schnorr signatures. And if you don't really know what, what Schnorr signatures are or ECDSA, it's basically, basically a different way of, of producing a signature. So imagine it like signing with your right hand and ECDSA is like signing with your left hand. It's still the same person who is signing it, but it's a different way of doing it. And they look very, they, they look differently. So adapter signatures by ECDSA were, uh, were built by Pedro Moreno Sanchez and Annika Kate in 2018. They achieved the same thing for ECDSA. And then Lloyd Fournier in 2019 extended it to be a lot more practical. Um, and then, we'll get to the Bitcoin Monero swap. So we now have a lot of the building blocks that are required. And Joel Guger, also commonly known as Hashed, he basically in 2020 released a paper uh, that put everything together and showed the world that Bitcoin Monero swaps are possible for the very first time. So he addresses some problems that I think are worth going over in his presentation. And the first problem he addressed was the refund problem. And the second problem is that Monero and Bitcoin are on different elliptic curves. So they're widely different cryptography and we need some kind of way to marry them. Um, so the refund problem, he basically fixed that by building a tiny ticking time bomb. And then the, the fact that they're on different elliptic curves is solved by using DLX. So how does an atomic swap work on Monero? Well, the first thing is that they pre-signed refund transactions which is basically the equivalent of signing your divorce papers before you get married. You will find a way to amicably, amicably split away in case one of the two people does something wrong or just disappears. And this only happens for Bitcoin. So let's take, let's take this example. Alice deposits her one Bitcoin after signing her end of the refund transactions. And then Bob basically waits for that transaction to confirm. And then only then will he deposit his Monero. Uh, then we consider both contracts fully funded and then they can start redeeming it. So the redemption uh, has to be on the Bitcoin blockchain uh, first, and that reveals the secret. Using those adapter signatures we described before. So the Monero side is actually a bit boring, to be honest. Um, it's, there's nothing special about the Monero transactions. They are just normal Monero transactions. All the magic is basically in how the key is generated. And the shared key is just an elliptic summation. So we'll, for example, we'll have a public key C, and that, that is just the addition of two other public keys, A and B, one for Alice, one for Bob. And public keys are just private keys multiplied by their generator point, and we can move around A and B to, to we can extract G into a separate entity, and then we can basically if you add the two private keys, you'll get this, the, the final key C that can be used to sign the transactions. Um, so what I want you to remember, you don't need to remember the math. You only need to remember that spending the Monero requires both halves of the key. Otherwise, you're basically unable, you're unable to refund without cooperation or continue. You must have that other half of the key. Uh, there's no other way around. The Bitcoin side, however, has a lot more going on. It has all the pre-signing of the refund transactions. There are certain limitations. It must go first. And once deposited, the money on the Bitcoin chain basically becomes a ticking time bomb. So how does it actually work on a Bitcoin chain? Because that's where the magic is at. So this is an example of, uh, of, a, of the contract. And as you can see, it kind of looks like an HTLC. It has this SHA-256, this hashing, part in it. 
But that hashing part does not serve the same purpose as in an HDLC. So we reveal a secret in that, in that hash lock, but it's not, it's, it's not, it's not uh, for the same purpose because it doesn't, on the monorail side doesn't support programming. So you, the secret is only leaked one time. So there's no linking between secrets. Um, but what it's basically used for, and this is not in the paper, that's why I tried to include it in the slides, is that you just, it's to make the other party wait for the money with the deposit to confirm. So they can double spend you and cheat you out of the system. Uh, the other thing that is changed from a hash time lock contract is that instead of a single signature, it requires a two of two multisig. And one of those signatures uh, will be an adapter signature that reveals the secrets. Um, and then we have the refund path. The refund path is where the ticking time bomb is at, and that's basically a timer that, that goes down and uh, just a normal two of two multisig. And this is the part that is pre-signed. So both parties will already have a way to spend the money that's inside this contract because of that refund path before they even deposit the money in there. So how does the refund path look? Well, we have a happy refund path and we have a sad refund path. In the happy refund path, um, Alice and Bob are still on okay terms. They want to get a divorce, but they are willing to both sign the paperwork. And in this case, um, we'll also have a two of two multisig and the adapter signature basically uh, leaks the secret that can then be used to get the monero as well. So um, Alice leaks her secret key and takes, and takes back BTC, allowing Bob to take back his monero. And the sad refund path is basically when uh, one of the two parties uh, decides to disappear. Um, Bob basically forcibly completes his end of the swap. So he put up the monero, uh, but you know Alice disappeared. Uh, so his monero is currently stuck. He can't get a refund. So what this contract allows him to do is to just be like, hey, after this timer, I'm taking back my money, whether you, your money, I'm taking back the Bitcoin, whether you like it or not. Like we're, we're not gonna do a, a nice, nice swap in that case. And that's basically the, the magic behind it. And then another problem, that we discussed was that Monero and Bitcoin are on different curves. And that's where DLX come in, which is a mouthful, it stands for discrete logarithm, logarithm equality across groups. There's a nice paper on it by the Monero Labs, MRL 10. You can take a look at it. It's very short, three, three pages. But basically, I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but it's a, it's a super cool proof. And it basically proves that, two private, that the same private key leads to two addresses on two different elliptic curves or blockchains, Monero and Bitcoin, without having to reveal the private key. Because if you have the private key, it's very easy to be like, hey, that's the address on Bitcoin, that's the address on Monero. But doing that without revealing the private key, that involves some, uh, some mathematics that uh, even I don't properly understand. So what can be improved? Well, like I mentioned, the Bitcoin has to go first. We have to wait for it to confirm. Then the Monero uh, gets deposited. Then we have to wait for the Monero to confirm. It's all very slow. Um, and that is something that ideally we could maybe fix. And it's all a problem because of the refund issue. Um, so also this approach still requires one of the two chains to have scriptability or programmability um, on the side of Bitcoin. And Monero also doesn't support pre-signing transactions. This is a bit of an annoying thing that can be fixed, uh, but essentially, um, we can't do this pre-signing of refund transactions, which if we could do it, if there was a hard fork for it, we probably could fix that. So let's go back to basic swap. Um, I hope uh, I did a good job of explaining it. And now you kind of know what goes under the hood of basic swap. Um, we're building a web version. So uh, if you're a developer, please join us on Matrix and uh, come have a little chat with us. Um, I want to thank everyone being here and definitely also the, uh, everyone at MoneroCon for coming. It's a great conference. Uh, it's my first time here, but uh, I think I'm gonna come back. And uh, I also wanna thank uh, the venue, Parallelnipolis. I really love this venue. It's always a great atmosphere, always great conferences. And uh, I definitely want to tell you to check out their Hacker Congress uh, in September or October. Uh, also a great conference. Thank you very much, that was it.